Greetings, and it is so good to be with you here uh, with you again. And thank you for inviting me in your places. As we now again look at uh, the letter to the Galatians in the series that we've been on for a while now, called Galatians for Freedom. And I hope you have a Bible with you, or some sort, or a tablet, or or your phone app, your Bible app on your phone app, as we look at this text. I want to begin by uh, mentioning a fellow by the name of John Bloom, who in one of his article, articles for DesiringGod.com asked the question, who are the freest people in the world? Answer, the people who are freest from the world. Well, Bloom's thesis goes something like this, quote, the secret to experiencing this freedom all depends on where home really is. Well, you might be asking yourself, what is Bloom talking about here? Well, to begin to sort this out, we need to know what Bloom is presu- that Bloom is presuming something about his readers, about you and me. And he's clear from the beginning to state that he's not looking for readers to give him a correct answer. Why? Well, one, Bloom presumes that his readers are Christian. Two, Christians should know that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's according to Galatians 5.1, and we'll be going over that in a few weeks or less. Three, because of Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And four, a Christian has been set free from striving to achieve a righteousness from God because it's by God's grace alone that a Christian has been given the gift of righteousness from God through faith in Christ alone. So what's this freedom thing all about? Well, Bloom is trying to get his readers to consider what it means to be free. He wants his readers to deal with their present reality in comparison to the biblical reality of freedom. So he asks his readers some penetrating questions. Are we really living the freedom that Christ has given us? And how free do you want to be? Well, Jesus once said, uh, so if the Son, speaking of himself, sets you free, you'll be free indeed. That's in John 8, 6. So the question, the question, the question, the question remains for you and me, how free do you want to be? How free do you want to be? Well, please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, and we will pick up uh, where we left off last week, and we'll begin in verse 8 of chapter 4, right through to 20. Chapter 8, uh, ver- chapter 4, pardon me, uh, and verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? whose slaves you want to become once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am. For I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Verse 15. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given, it to, given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I'm present with you, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, I just ask now that you would set me aside, that you would uh, uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit uh, to be able to preach your word, that we would receive your word, Lord, and that we would not only hear your word, but we would learn it 
and that we would put it into action in our lives and around our lives. And we would do this, all this, for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, as we engage our text, uh, we recognize that we have in our hands a first century letter, a copy of a first century letter. But like many letters of the day, there were no chapter and verse divisions in ancient letters. So Paul begins with a conjunction, which points us to what he had stated previously as he transitions to the heart of the matter. And Paul had said earlier, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Paul had traveled through Galatia, bringing the gospel message, and following behind Paul, false Jewish teachers began to convince some Galatian believers to adopt the Mosaic law. Paul's gospel had been received and believed by many of the Gentiles in his travels, and it was the power of that, of that gospel that had transformed the Galatians. He also said this, uh, said this to the Romans in the first chapter, verse 16, where Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In his context, first to the Jew and then the Gentile. It was this transformative power of the gospel of Christ that had redeemed those who were under the law, according to verse 4, uh, verse 5 of chapter 4. Paul had already stated that Galatians at one time had been enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. That's verse 3. That is, until God sent forth his Son. That's verse 4. To redeem those who would believe by faith. There was more. Not only had Christ redeemed the Galatian believers, but they had also been adopted as sons. Now think about how amazing that is. How wonderful that is. God also adopts the redeemed as his beloved children. God, in restoring our relationship with him through his son Christ, means that we can have an intimate relationship with God our Father. For he treats every believer, he treats you and me, as his dearly loved son and daughter. And so when we pray to our good Father in heaven, we can say, Dear Daddy, what a wonderful, amazing thing that we have because of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul now goes back to the Galatians' original spiritual condition by stating this. Formerly, when you did not know God. Formerly, when you did not know God. Now, in a conversation, has ever, in a conversation you may have had with people, have you ever heard someone say, I believe in God? My question to you is, how would you know that they believe in God? How do you know that I believe in God? How do I know that you believe in God? You know, I'm reminded of what James said in his letter. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James chapter 2, verse 19. I think maybe this will... This was what Paul was asking the Galatian believers here in this letter. Do you truly believe in God? Do you truly believe in God? And Paul wanted to know, so he reminds them of their enslavement. He reminds them of their previous spiritual condition. Here in verse 8, you were enslaved to those who by nature are not gods. The Galatians, as one commentator put it, quote, had been slaves to pagan gods. They they, they, they followed Zeus and Hermes and, and others of the, of the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods in the first century. We go to Paul in his Roman letter, and there he clearly outlines what an unbeliever's, uh, outlines what an unbeliever's enslavement looks like. And people in Paul's day and in our day are without excuse. For what can be known of God, Paul would say in chapter 1 of Romans, has been made plain because God has revealed it to one and all. No one, my friends, has an excuse. And many people choose not to honor God, as Paul would say in Romans 1, or give thanks to him, and thereby they become fools. 
And Paul puts it so well in his letters to the Romans that these folks have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's Romans 1.23. And in our context, it just looks a little different. And because they do not see fit to acknowledge God, that's Romans 1.28, God gave them up to a debased mind, to a depraved mind, to do what ought not to be done. Well, friends, then we go into verse 9, and we encounter another conjunction. But, but now that you have come to know God, or rather known by God. So, friends, we're back to the beloved sons and daughters of God. The Galatians had been redeemed from the bondage of pagan gods, who are in reality not gods. Remember, the Bible teaches behind all false religions, and all false teachings are demons. And the Galatians had been hoodwinked by Satan and his demons, but had been redeemed from their bondage and had been received as sons and daughters of God the Father. And this brings Paul to ask this question. How? How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? That's verse 9. How can you turn back and return to slavery once more. Why? As he said to the Colossians in his letter to them, in chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why? Why do you submit to regulations? And we see here in verse 10, it tells us that some of the Galatian believers had decided to observe the Mosaic calendar. Just read verse 10 for yourself. They were observing, what does it say there? Days and months. That's the weekly Sabbaths and the new moon celebrations. And then it it says seasons and years. And that would have been the festivals, the Passover, the Pentecost, and so forth. And Paul's disappointment is evident as he concluded, I am afraid I may have labored over in you in vain. Well, what was Paul afraid? Why was Paul afraid? Well, the Galatians were evidently trading uh, one slave master for a, another slave master. From enslavement, enslavement to the demons of paganism to the demonic slavery of legalism, which could not and would not produce an ounce of godly life in them, would not bring righteousness before a holy and just God, and there would be no freedom in this. Well, this brings up a question. Were those turning to legalism truly saved? See, Paul had described their freedom from the bondage of paganism, their adoption as sons and daughters of God. How was it that these false teachers were able to change their minds, even their hearts possibly, to accept another slave master, legalism? Well, frankly, we cannot answer these questions with certainty. Suffice to say, we are not able to judge a person's heart, only their actions, only the fruit. And Paul, indeed, here said he was perplexed. He was at a loss to explain it all at this point. But as much as Paul, my friends, may have been perplexed, we see no sign of him giving up on the Galatian believers as he now changes his tone quite clearly here, beginning at verse 12. Up to this point, Paul's tone was uh, direct and might have felt harsh. But now it changes as he said this to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. Here Paul appealing to the friendship that he had established with the Galatians upon his preaching of the gospel to them. Paul saw himself as an equal to the Galatians. He did not lord this over to them, over them. He himself had rejected the law. He rejected legalism. And as one commentator put it, quote, now challenges the Galatians to become like him by also rejecting legalism. Paul, as we see here in the text, had been received by the Galatians warmly, even though he was suffering some sort of ailment at the time. Just read the text, you'll see that. The Galatians had received Paul. They had received this gospel as they were receiving, as if they were receiving an angel of the Lord, it tells us. Even Christ, 
if it was possible, even Christ Jesus himself. They had received Paul then and his gospel with joy. But things seemed to have changed. Verse 15, so what had become of their blessedness, their joy? Paul was at a loss to explain. Paul then uses hyperbole. And he said, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. But now, but now I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. That's verse 16. Well, it seems that the false teachers had gotten their hooks into some of the Galatians. They had convinced these Galatians that Paul was possibly not an apostle. And that Paul's gospel was deficient because he did not include the law, the Mosaic law. And now they would treat Paul like an enemy because he was telling them the truth. Well, this is quite interesting to me. And if uh, we take a look around the current evangelical landscape and see how the biblical gospel in many ways is seen as deficient, if that were at all possible. And those who proclaim the biblical gospel, which I hope I do, are at times treated as enemies of the church these days. And it seems that the freedom Christians have because of the crucified Christ, as described in this book, is no longer enough. My friends, the truth of God's word is under attack from without, and sadly now, also from within the church. Matter of fact, it's always been attacked from within the church, I believe. And I think it would profit us to spend a moment or two examining a few of the characteristics of false teachers and the impact that teaching would have on an individual and in a church as well. And I want to recognize the, uh, the work of Ryan Putman in an article that he has in crossway.org for some of the ideas here. So it's, it's noticeable, if you, you pay attention, false teaching preys on the spiritually immature. The spiritually immature. Immature here doesn't mean, spiritually immature doesn't mean something bad. We all start as uh, babes in Christ, if you want to call that, as babies in Christ. But false teaching preys on the spiritually immature. You know, and, and when you read through Paul's letters, we find his concern for the mind of the believers. And at times he does caution, uh, caution his uh, readers to be careful so not to be led astray. As we see even here in Galatians, when he said to the Galatians, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. We, we read that at the very beginning of this series. Friends, we need to be firmly rooted and grounded in the truth. And in order to do that, we need to read and study the Bible. We need to give it more than lip service. You need to do that, my friends. You need to spend plenty of time reading your Bible in context and studying it in depth. Context and depth. You need to attend a biblically sound church one that practices the ordinances of, of the church, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and the proper preaching and teaching of the word, and the, and, and the holy uh, lifting up and worshiping of God and his, son, and his Son, Jesus Christ. And we need to pray, friends. We always need to pray. And also, it's very evident today in the evangelical circles and around the world, too, False teaching can result from and lead to inappropriate sensuality and sexual morality. We lived in a sex-crazed world, my friends. It's a, sex is a good thing in the, in, in the context of the way God describes it, that God created it in the, as we read in the Bible. When we look, at, for example, at the prosperity gospel, it is a breeding ground of such immoral behaviors. And why is that so? Because it appeals to our sinful desires. The prosperity gospel appeals to our sinful desires, you know, for fame and riches and power. That's what we, we, we deserve because of, of Christ. Well, it's a false teaching. And any teaching rooted in immoral desire 
will result in immoral behavior. And we see the fallout of this false prosperity gospel in immoral behavior. Apostle Peter said in his second letter, second chapter, verse 1 and 2, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, and many will follow their sensuality, and the way of truth will be blasphemed, as it is so often today in many churches. And moving along, now past this, Paul now drills down to the heart of the matter. Down to the heart of the matter, where he said, they make much of you, speaking of the Judaizers, for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. So here, my friends, was the true intent of the Judaizers. The reason they had come to the Galatian believers with their reasoning and teaching of the law. This reminds me of a wolf pack and how a wolf pack hunts bigger animals, much bigger animals than themselves. And they use a four-point four point strategy in the hunt. One, they chase the prey. Two, they surround the prey. Three, they test for weakness. And four, they take down the prey. Well, the Judaizers in their preaching of the law were trying to separate the Galatian believers from Paul and build their own case. And Paul exposed this strategy, this strategy, 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 strategy. I'm having a hard time, folks. Forgive me on that. And I'll move on. And motives. You know, when we think of Paul's, that's hilarious, isn't it? Anyways, we think of Paul's life as a minister of Christ's gospel. When we look at his, read his letters, when we consider him in the book of Acts, there is no one like him, no other kind of defender of the faith like him in the New Testament other than the Lord Jesus himself. And I think sometimes our 21st century sensibilities get in our way when we read some of the hard, of the hard things that Paul says, but they are truth. And one thing we know for sure, Paul would not entertain any of the mumble-jumble that is going on in Christ's body uh, today, Christ's church today. You see, Paul was a soldier for Christ. He endured much. He stayed the course. He kept his eye on the prize. And he changed the spiritual landscape of the Roman Empire almost single-handedly. However, if we're not careful, we might miss out on Paul's pastoral heart. For he said to the Galatians, My little children, for who I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Paul had the right motives toward the Galatians. So what were Paul motives, Paul's motives? Well, if anything, we see here Paul's love for the Galatians as he calls them, my little children. Who says things like that? Think about it. Well, moms do. And don't Paul here, and doesn't Paul here compare himself to a mother amid birth pangs? Paul had been in the anguish of childbirth, he said. Why? So that Christ would be formed in the Galatians. And where did this kind of love come from, Paul? What motivated Paul to do this? Well, he told the church at Philippi, for to me to live is Christ. You see, for Paul, it wasn't being an apostle or money or fame, that's for sure, that motivated him. It was living for Christ. That's what motivated him. And Paul then could say with all integrity, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to, be, how, how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned a secret to facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthened me. That's Philippians 4, uh, verse 12 and 13. See, Paul wanted to be with the Galatians so that he could gently yet firmly, firmly correct them and strengthen them. Well, as we bring this to a close, we go back to the question we started with. How free do you want to be? How do you think Paul would answer this question? Well, Jesus once said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 38. If I were a betting man, which I am not, I would bet that many who call themselves Christians today, 
when push came to shove, would say that freedom for them means the ability to do what they want, when they want, with who they want. Which in reality describes what the Apostle John said in his first letter, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. My friends, in our flesh, we are so like the character Ebenezer Scrooge in The Christmas Carol. We clutch, we grab, we hold on to the things of this world with a death grip. My friends, if we want to be free, we need to let go of this world. For as John said in his letter, the world is passing away along with its desires. And when we let go of this world, it will feel like we are losing our life. But let us heed the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who said, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Who are the freest people in the world? The people who are freest from the world. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And I just pray for those who are hearing this message from your word, from Galatians. Uh, I just pray, to God, that they would uh, have the ears to hear and the heart to understand, the mind to understand and the heart to receive this message from your word. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters, wherever they may be, that you would strengthen them, that you would comfort them, that you give them the courage to stand and stand firm in Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for inviting me in your places. God bless you. Shalom.